Hi, everybody. It's James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and I am doing episode number seven, October 1st, and it is going to be just, uh, responding to a group member's question in one of my live vlogs, and it's in my group, um, Reactive Skittish Dangerous Dog uh, Down Training Support Group, that I'm doing this, so I am going to get to it here. So uh, one of the members in my group, Eva, she has uh, two puppies, two great Dane puppies um, that are about six and seven months of age that she adopted from a rescue, which is great, you know, adopting rescues. Um, so, so just a few things. I'm just I, I've posted it in the description here of the post, um, but you can basically read it. I'll just kind of go over it real real quickly. Uh, my husband and I adopted two beautiful Great Dane puppies at the end of this April. They are not from the same litter, but came to our house. On the same day, Maui is seven months old and Paris is six months. Both girls are still intact. We have no other pets indoors, just three chickens living in the backyard. It sounds like a James Taylor song. Um, so Maui was a shy puppy who bonded immediately. Who bonded immediately with my husband and Paris. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Maui was a shy puppy who bonded immediately with my husband and Paris was this happy go lucky. Uh, go lucky, uh, daredevil, significantly smaller but feisty opposite. Paris was outgoing and friendly, but I had a harder time connecting with Maui. We brought a dog trainer who suggested I go to puppy school with only Maui to spend some quality time together. Fast forward five months, we could use help with the following situations. We understand they are still puppies and nothing is perfect and they are good dogs, but due to their size, we want to work on things earlier than later. That sound you hear in the background is Anthony chewing on a humongous bone. Anthony, 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 <laughs> so, um, okay, so, uh, and I've done a response already, I've already provided a response back to it, so it's going to be kind of hard for those of you who aren't in the group to follow through, like I say, you're more than welcome to uh, join my uh, my group, and then, um, then you can read what the rest of it is, but, uh, so, you've got the questions there, potty in the house we take them out for at least four times a day twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon they get plenty of exercise uh in the dog park as well maui and paris stay in the fenced area in our house while we are at work sorry that my my computer my my desktop is a little bit further away than um so i'm kind of straining on this here um okay within the area we have provided a second sleeping location which should stop the daily total destruction of the pee pads however we can be two hours in the dog park come home and 30 minutes later one of them pees a lot on the pad or right next to it they drink a lot of water and go at least once when outside but at the same time they don't seem to be holding inside at all paris will indicate that she has to go by uh, standing in front of the door molly just goes inside when she needs so um, I'm always just doing whatever she wants. So uh, one of the things that, and I'm just going to go point by point because this is number one. So my response there was, um, have you tried reducing their water intake? How much water are they drinking? Anthony, stop. Okay, go, go, Anthony. Holy cow, it's like in my ear. Um, uh, have you tried reducing the water intake? How much water are they drinking? He just moved like, he just moved like three feet. Uh Okay, how much water are they drinking? Is Maui drinking water often? If so, when and how much? And, uh, you know, it's one of the questions I asked in my survey, uh, behavioral survey. Anybody who's taken my behavioral survey, please just be aware that unfortunately the plugin crashed or something is wrong with it and everybody's answers are lost. And I'm not, not happy about that. Okay, so, um, so her response was, uh, what is it here? Hi, James, thank you so much for your post. We have started to implement your advice. Paris is now on a harness as well. More on the stories. Maui grew up with her mom, and I think she's one of seven or eight puppies. She had a loving foster family who spent time with them and took them places, socialized them well. The family raised the puppies and ended up keeping them mom. There was another neutered male Dane in the house as well. Paris is one of 13 puppies, if I remember correctly, nine of which were surrendered to the uh, rescue when they were seven weeks old. The foster family took care of the puppies. For approximately three weeks until they were ready to transport and then we knew nothing about the parents paris was invested with work uh best oh, oh okay it's a mistake the mess spelling mistake there. uh paris was infected with worms i guess she means um when she arrived but i am very fresh but i very fresh puppy okay uh, 
Uh, right, so uh, her response back to my response was, uh, for number one, was, Potty, behind, between the two of them, they drink one gallon of water per day. We have limited water access to, uh, oh, we have limited their water access overnight. My husband gets up early to take them outside. Sometimes they get so excited and will pee on the pad instead of two minutes later when he takes them in. Uh, takes them in the morning. I will take them out an hour after my husband and each will pee at least once. However, they can't hold it for the day when we come back from work seven hours later. They just seem to pee a lot. Vet checked them for UTIs and they are fine. Okay, so one of the uh, problems that a lot of people end up having to do is, okay, well, why is my dog peeing so much? And I don't know why my dog is peeing so much. Oh my gosh, my dog has a medical issue. So um, just looking at that part, they're a gallon of water between two Danes, right? Two adult, uh, they're not even adult Danes. They're just baby Danes, right? The puppy Danes, maybe 80, 90 pounds. So they're relatively small. That's 128 ounces of water. That's like just four liters of water metric. That is 128 ounces of water. Between the two dogs, that's 64 ounces of water. That's that's a half, that's two gallons. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a half gallon of water. So, uh, you know, that's eight ounces of water. Uh, you know, eight, sorry, eight cups of water per day. So that's a lot of water for anybody to drink, no matter what. You're expecting uh, two young dogs to be able to hold that for seven or eight hours. So it's natural that they're going to be peeing. And I think, um, you know, somebody else had posted in, in your post in my group, perhaps, and I would suggest this as well, is reducing the amount of water that they have at night. It's not a necessity, and it can also add to some other issues of uh, uh Codependency, insecurity, low self-esteem as well. Uh, but I don't think that's the case in this situation here. So, uh, again, I would reduce the amount of water that they're drinking because, again, eight, ounce, eight, eight cups of water is a lot. That's 64 ounces in, in a day. And I know um, when I tried to do the drink eight glasses of water myself when I was younger, I was, I was, <laughs> I was uh, you know, pretty well wearing a diaper. So it's not great. Um, and, again, these are smaller dogs that are half the size of an adult. Uh, their bladder is not going to be able to handle them much. So again, just give them just enough water. Because what's also happening is that they're just somewhat bored. They're somewhat, um, you know, insecure. And they're going to start drinking water because of that. As well as, you know, the water tastes good if it's fresh. So uh, again, just reduce the amount of water, especially at night. And if they're peeing inside the home after you come in from the, uh, from the yard, it's just because they're just so used to peeing all the time. And you want to kind of get a hold of that. So it's not something that I typically deal with uh, in this type of discussion uh, and behaviors. So the second one is walking on leash. So the original uh, question by uh, number two from, from this owner of this family is walking on leash. We have Paris on a gentle leader and Maui on a harness lead. This has already improved the walk. My husband has never had the following issue described. So this is meaning that the poster, uh, um, she is having problems on her husband. The walk is good until they decide to play on the leash. And then it's impossible for me to walk with them. Maui will prance to make two, three special strides, which I'm not sure what that means. Uh, after which Paris will jump on her and bite her neck. And Maui will do the same to Paris. So the, nine out of ten times we are fine. But if they are not exhausted from the park or didn't play there enough... With each other, it will happen. I don't have any footage as it takes all my strength and focus to separate them when it does happen. So, uh, oh, and I should say the, um, uh, the mom's name is Eva. All right, so my reply on point number two. It sounds that Paris and Molly get along very well. The video of them with the ball that she had posted shows they have a great bond that they have between each other. And, you know, how are they off leash, I asked her. So uh, we'll find out from her response in number two there. Um, but the video is just these two, the two of them, Maui and Paris, playing with each other, and they're just, you know, off and off playing each other. They're not really being confrontational in any way whatsoever. It's actually a nice uh, relationship that the two have, and but the bond is getting quite uh, established between the two of them. So Eva, take a look at that video again. You see the bit of a bond there, and then you're going to see where there's a point of deference from one of the dogs to the other dog. And, um, you know, I can't remember which is which, unfortunately, just because it's just a, a lot of details here. Uh, but the dog, the Dane on the bottom, left-hand side of that video versus the right-hand side, you can see the one on the right-hand side is starting to become a little bit more um, uh, confident. How's that? Okay, so um, uh, what is it there? So uh, I said, if it uh, number two, it sounds that Paris and Maui get along very well. The video of them with the ball shows they have a great bond they have with each other. How are they on off leash? When you take them outside, spend one full minute to be calm with them. They want 
to leave, you calmly stand or crouch or squat behind, beside them, calming them down. Do this when you return home. When you walk them, when either one of them starts to initiate and getting rambunctious, calm them down the same way. So for number two, uh, her response, Eva's response back was, so this is the final response back, was walking on leash. Both wear a harness now. I have managed to get them on the video playing. It's a light version, which is why I was able to tape it. They will stop that nonsense if someone whose male walks by and says no to them without even touching them or the leashes. Uh, it, it says, it's, I'm kind of paraphrasing just because um, it's a little bit difficult to follow this here. Uh, I had this happen before. Uh, Maui also has a tendency to try and mouth my arm and when she doesn't stop after I tell Paris, uh, after I tell her, Paris will nip her. This or me trying to stop them from chewing on the leash has led to these walking incidences. Uh, incidents. I try to catch it early, but sometimes there is no warning signal. I will walk with them thinking today is all going well. Everyone will walk. No one will. Uh, everyone will walk on one of my sides and then it happens. They don't pull too much on the leash and I have started to stop when they do. They seem to know the command, wait at lights, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, I'm not sure what it is that you're saying that they're doing, Eva. Um, so that's kind of been a little bit of a confusion in the first post uh, as well as this follow-up here. Um, if you, oh, let me just fix that here. Um, so if you're talking about them being rambunctious and being excited and all that, it goes back to what I was saying in the first, uh, my first response was you've got to correct that. And by keeping in mind that dogs react at one-tenth of a second, there's no such thing as unpredictable or I just didn't know what was happening. And, you know, and I'm just being straightforward because everyone that knows me, that's hired me, they know I just, I tell you, I'm not going to pussyfoot around, I'm going to tell you what I, what I feel in that part. So uh, the unpredictability is not an accurate aspect of it because what it means is that you've somewhat become complacent or just thought, okay, it's all right, and then you've kind of let your guard down, which is essentially what it is. And a lot of times, owners, families, people, rescues will say that, you know, my dog is fine, my dog is fine, and all of a sudden they just did something, and I thought it was a great day. That's when it always tends to happen, doesn't it? When we're not paying attention and we think that everything is okay, the dogs being predacious in nature, right? They're predators to begin with. They're going to look intrinsically for something. So they're going to be looking for that. So in this part here, the two of them uh, uh, jumping around and, and playing with each other and being somewhat uh, rambunctious. And uh, I'm assuming, see, again, I don't know what it is that they're doing, but I'm assuming that the that, uh, Paris and Maui are, you know, lunging at people or they're playing with each other. I'm going to assume that they're playing with each other. And, and if that's the case, then it's a matter of you paying attention to what they're doing. It is a matter of you watching them vigilantly, vigilant, vigilant, vigilant vigilantly at all times to be able to address that because when you watch them vigilantly and they start to react natural behavior of human beings is we do our what I said yesterday accident reconstruction we go back mentally subconsciously we know what has happened and we've registered that and then we can reconstruct what happened in our mind so again pay attention to Maui and Paris at all times once you let that that, that vigilance, that consistency, that supervision off of either dog, they're going to notice that and then they're going to do what they want to do. And then, then you're struggling trying to bring them back into line and they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So this then also infers to me that your husband is more of a person who's a bit quieter and he's a person who somewhat maintains a bit more of a, uh, of a, a stronger tone of voice. And the way he talks is probably quite soothing, somewhat mellow, but soothing, again, with a stronger tone of voice. And that's probably why he's getting a bit more success in keeping them from being reactive. When you're talking about people walking by and um, someone says no, I don't have the context of it, and I am not going to guess about that. When it comes to Maui, has a tendency to try to mouth your arm. Uh, again, I don't know the context of it. And you're saying that Maui uh, uh, um, goes for your arm, and then Paris will nip at her to stop. So what Paris obviously is doing is saying, hey, you know what, it's not cool what you're doing. What Maui is doing out of that part is her insecurity and her feeling that um, she doesn't have the proper type of attention with you. So there's a certain type of attention, which is why you're able to maintain control of them if you're paying attention. So when you're not paying attention, when you're not seeing what's going on, then the dog themselves will go, oh, uh -huh, whatever, and they'll start to, again, look for things that are um, that are open. Um, Let's see here. 
Okay, so uh, uh, this, uh, so, and the nipping part as well, that, that, that's an anxiety driven issue. Most times on a higher dysfunction dog, this aspect here of the dog uh, nipping your arm, uh, Maui nipping your arm, uh, again, is more than likely a, an attention aspect of it. So you want to address that. And then it comes to, I try to catch it early, but sometimes there's no warning signs, right? Okay, right. Uh, I will walk with them thinking today's the day. Okay, they don't pull much. They seem to know the command. Wait, oh, right. Okay, sorry. So we read that part here. Um, okay, and then the third one is Paris starts. Okay, so this is the original post that Eva put up. Paris barking and skittishness. Paris has turned into this barker. When our neighbors come and go, she sees strangers on a walk or a new dog in the dog park. She will try to hide behind your legs in the park if she isn't sure of the dog or owner while Maui most likely plays with the same dogs. Paris has her favorite friends with which she does play very rough. Paris is not confident and very skittish when taken for a walk by herself. However, more sure with my husband, Maui and Paris do play very rough as well. Maui's fur is, uh, is very, very short and she has always marked on her skin uh, from obviously, I'm just assuming from the play fighting. Please help us understand. Okay. Um, all right. And then, um, uh, my response to number three was Paris's bark is. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, number three, Mickey, stop. Thank you. Uh, as they bond, this is my response. Number three, as they bond, they will get better being left along, uh, being left a, a, a alone when you leave the house. It takes time for them to feel safe with each other when they are left alone. It takes time. Uh, and I said along, so I made the same mistake too. Uh, when they rough play, make sure to calm them down sooner than later. You want them both to know they are not letting them rough house too much. Paris has some prey drive as Maui is more reserved with an old soul. Paris is becoming reactive. It's due to her wanting to protect her sister Maui. Uh, and then I asked what the events are that happen to reactivity. So number three, Eva replies back. Paris's bark is loud and deep. As far as the frequency, I'm still trying to get a video to show you. It has changed now from hiding to charging. I hope to get a video soon as none of the dogs has ever done anything to her. She gets all worked up when Maui doesn't even move one ear. Okay, so you know, um, I've also had a hard time stopping them from playing too hard because once they are in the zone, they won't listen. Okay, so when it comes to Paris's bark and that she's now gone from hiding to charging, right? Those are the aspects of her finding that there is a... Um, um, and inconsistency in the way you're taking care of them. Again, just not being vigilant, not making sure that everything's happening. So being predacious in nature, the dog's dog, Paris, is going to find the opportunity to say, hey, you know what? You're not doing your job to protect us. I'm just a little baby. You need to protect us. And it doesn't matter if they're 80 pounds and they're, you know, 20 inches at the withers. Is the fact that you're not paying attention to them and you're not making it evident to them that they're understanding which is why um, when your husband is out there and again just inferring what kind of demeanor he has uh, hi William what kind of demeanor that you have it's going to be that point where she is just looking for what you're not doing which is the attention pay, making sure you're taking care of it and this has nothing to do with dominance and as I said yesterday there's no such thing as dominance uh, as per se in in the dysfunction aspects of these uh, these dogs and reactivity or skittishness, etc. The dog themselves is essentially trying to understand their own psychology and work past that. And we want to be able to help them by protecting them and letting our dogs know that they're safe. And uh, so when Paris is going uh, from hiding to charging, that means that more than anything else, um, that you have not been paying attention to what's going on with Paris. And uh, again, she's feeling that you're not protecting her, making her feel safe, letting her know that she's safe. Uh, you're not paying attention to her, and then she's trying to react towards other people or dogs. Uh, again, I, I'm not sure what it is, uh, the information. And the, then you have a video here of, uh, of the two dogs, uh, the two Danes, and then you're standing on one of their, uh, their ropes, uh, their leashes, I, I guess that's the leash then. Um, so what you want to do is you want to be able to have physical control of those leashes. Standing on those leashes is an application of, uh, of supervision, uh, Eva. Uh, you want to be able to have them in your hands because now you're holding it by your foot on the ground. The dog doesn't have any understanding of direction. And I talked about that part about the leash behavior before. Leash manners that we ourselves, human beings, must be able to uh, provide to our dogs. And what's happening is if you're not in control of the leash and the leash is laying on the ground, uh, that's a difficulty. So then what that means is if you're dropped on the leash, and some people do that because the dog is too hard to handle, etc., etc., and so you stand on it because it's easier. 
So let's look at the reality of that part and let's look at the reality of the leash aspect of that part, which is uh, for a typical human being, let's just say, you know, an average 150 pound person and the Dane is 80 pounds, even if we say 100 pounds, right? So physics wise, just standing there, the dog is not supposed to be able to pull us. If we're paying attention, there's no way we can pull us, right? How many times have you had somebody try to pull you along somewhere? And you're like, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going, and they're pulling you. So it comes to that part of you having to have some supervision on your leash and not letting uh, Eva or Paris, I'm sorry, not Eva, sorry, uh, Paris or Maui pull you. So you've got to have that control. Your dogs need to know that you have the leash in your hands at all times when you're doing that. If you're off leash with them, if you're letting them run around, absolutely, they can do whatever they want and, and, and be doggies, puppies. But when you have the leash and they are attached to the leash, they're, they're on the clock. They're on the clock, right? They're paying attention to what you're saying to them at all times. Uh, so again, pick up the leash off that. Um, and it's kind of hard to see what else was going on. So um, I apologize uh, not being able to give you more information, but I, I wanted to kind of do that part. Um, I'm going to look at something else here now, just to shift gears. And uh, hopefully I can see this here. Um, I'm going to go to one of the uh, reactive uh, dog groups I'm in. And I'm just going to look at this one here. Um, so I'm just kind of breezing through here. Uh, so, so someone says here in their thing, and, and you know, again, this is more of a uh, on a behavior aspect. So someone writes, uh, you know, I've tried to figure out all the triggers for my dog. I've treated him like one of my kids. He will do well for a while, then snap. When he growls, it's usually over something as simple as touching his feet. It's so low, I don't always hear it, but it makes me it makes me mad. I feel like the dog is training me, not training him. He came from a rescue and had a shock collar on him. Uh, when I met him, I've taken and uh, I've taken in aggressive dogs before. Sorry, that's one of the horses drinking water. William, thank you, William. Thanks, it's perfect. Uh, I've taken in aggressive dogs before, and they take time, but they mellow out. This one is very different. I've had my Dobermans. Uh, I've had Dobermans before, but not one like this. No matter what, if I don't look back, uh, if I don't back off when he growls, even if I'm just petting him, he'll attack. It escalates from one bite to multiple bites, and he goes for my face. Luckily, I don't have small kids. He'll stand his ground, showing his teeth and growling. If I don't back off, I'll get bit, so he wins. Should I get a shock collar or a muzzle? Or a muzzle? I need to control him from not controlling, uh, controlling me. Stop, William. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, right off the bat, my, my opinion about shock collars, uh, uh, um, prong collars, and so forth like that, I'm just going to say that again. Um, for a professional, it's not something that you should be using. It is a brute force tool, and, uh, you know, it is basically if someone is having pain, and then you cause them to have more pain, and that's what the prong collar is. And dogs do have a tolerance of pain, of course, but they do register everything. William, thank you. Uh, so if, the, if what you want to do, again, uh, what they should do is not consider the prong collar, right? It's, you know, for people who are, are owners, family, parents, um, then, and I, and I go through that owners, parents, family, just because some people are like, oh, I'm an owner and I don't, I don't you know, anyways. Um, so, uh, you know, prong collars and shock collars are brute force devices. It is a physical aspect of it. If we were to use brute force on one of our, you know, our friends or our girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, the likelihood of them staying around is going to be very limited. So we want to, you know, I personally want to get away from stuff like that. And I just want to see the, the industry get away from something like that. Um, so when it, when it comes to, um, let's see. Okay. So, so this person is, you know, this trainer, right. Uh, has tried out the, uh, to figure out the triggers for, for her dog. And so um, treats them like one of her kids and all that stuff. So here's the thing is, if you're treating your dog like one of your kids, etc., etc., and you love them so much, what's your dog's name? Remember I said that the other day, using your dog's name, using your dog's name, using your dog's name. The name of your dog is so important because why else did you name your dog? Other than you just calling, hey, dog. You need to use, people need to use, we need to use our dog's name. When we're communicating with them. That's the only way they know we're talking to them. Um, okay, so treated them like one of my kids, etc., etc. So that's an expression of exasperation. 
Prescott, sorry, I'll repeat that. Uh, that's an expression of exasperation, which is basically saying, I've done everything I can. I don't know. I've done it. And I've tried all my tricks in the book. Like I said that yesterday as well, because the current dog industry here does not understand dogs on a psychological level, level uh, then they just basically like, well, you know, trick one, trick two, trick three, trick four. Let's go through our playbook. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, etc. cetera. Uh, right off the bat there, um, that's the thing. And then he goes, uh, then the person goes, uh, um, he will do well for a while, then snap. When he growls, he it's usually over something as simple as touching his feet. So here's the aspect of it. When you're touching your dog's feet. It's a trust issue. Absolute trust issue. Absolute trust issue. And taking these liberties on another being, another person, another dog, uh, is a liberty of trust. If it's not established, and say he has, uh, her dog has sensitive feet, ticklish feet, what do you think your dog's going to feel when you start doing something when they don't trust you and they don't, they're not familiar with that feeling? So, you know, I've gone out pe with, with somebody and, and, you know, try to give her a foot massage, and she's like, oh my gosh, I don't touch my feet. And I'm like, oh shoot, and I didn't know that. And I'm like, okay, I was just trying to be nice. And then I think, okay, that's my fault, not her fault. So, so this is situation is it's got to be your right as a trainer themselves. They should be able to look at it, and go, okay, you know what? I kind of pushed it too far. The unpredictability that uh, that she writes about, about the trainer writes about, is that he will do a while, do well for a while, and then snap. That is an aspect of not understanding the signals, the body behavior that your dog is exhibiting nor is she communicating with her dog because then she would be having an active connection to what's going on with her dog. And I'm, I'm not talking a disingenuous conversation. I'm talking an actual, real, connective conversation with her dog so that her dog and her are having some sort of interaction so she can recognize when her dog's about to behave. If you're not looking at somebody, if you're not paying attention to them, and they do something like, oh, that was out of the blue. But it wasn't because... The, you violate their, their space. So touching the feet is just that ridiculous part of just making such a liberty. And a lot of people go, you know, I want to touch my dog, make sure that he's not going to be reactive, etc. But you got to earn that trust. Um, and then, uh, okay, so they had said as well, it starts growling. And then um, uh, it's so low, I don't always hear it, but it makes me mad. I feel like the dog is training me, not me training him. There you go, right? So that's the arrogance of humanity. It doesn't matter if it's a trainer or a human, you know, a parent, dog parent, or just a regular human being. It's so low, I don't always hear it, but it makes me mad. I feel like the dog is training me, not me training him. If you don't have the trust, if you don't understand and respect the dog, if you don't respect your dog, then it's essentially, guys, stop. Stop, please. Stop, please. Go, Anthony. Uh, he's just like chewing this uh, thing right in my ear. Um, so it, 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 it's that part where when it comes to the dog being reactive to being touched and so forth like that and growling, he's saying, stop bugging me. Stop touching me. I don't trust you to do so. Which means that also infers that the, this trainer has tried a little too hard to get involved with her dog's behavior and create a trust so that way they're like okay great now i've got it all over with and that's a problem especially when um the trainer then writes on saying i've had other dogs before like this other dobermans and they've never had an issue and this one's the worst uh situation that i've had to deal with so again it comes to the part of oh well the dog didn't follow my usual playbook because i just followed that procedure um let's just see here uh yeah yeah and she says i've taken an aggressive dogs before and, and they take time but they mellow out this one is different I've had Dobermans before, but not one like this. No matter what, if I don't back off when he growls, even if it's just petting him, he'll attack. Well, again, of course. So if you're violating, if you're violating someone's attention, if you're violating um, someone's uh, space, what are they going to do? They're going to react. If you're touching someone's feet without the permission or knowledge, they're going to react. So I'm not talking about the dog as a human being, but I'm saying if we start imagining that as a someone, as a human being, you start touching someone's feet and they don't like their feet touch or they don't trust you or they're ticklish, they're going to react. So for this uh, trainer to then start doing that means, okay, I'm not paying attention to my dog's signs and I don't recognize my dog's signs, but I'm just going to keep doing it anyways without acknowledging that I'm irritating my dog. And well, my dog just bit me. I wonder why. So then it goes to the part where it escalates from one bite to multiple bites and then he goes for the face. 
It's right off the bat. It's a betrayal of trust. It just comes down to the same old, same old. It's a betrayal of trust. So the dog reacting from the point of a single bite to a multiple bites and the going towards the face is saying, I warned you and you're just doing it again and again and again. And say, for example, again, I'm using everything as a human analogy. You're in a marriage and your partner says to you one day, you just don't understand me. I want a divorce. That's what's going on with this. Your dog doesn't understand what's going on from you because you keep doing the same things over and over again and you haven't respected your dog's space nor have you built trust or tolerance to touching your dog's feet or other aspects of their body and then your dog reacts. I mean, I've, I've had dogs, like we're talking significantly giant dogs that are five and a half feet body-wise from bum, not tail, from bum to head to nose, five and a half feet long. And I've walked with with them uh, in my in the in the home here, and down because I rent a really small old house, so the the walls the the hallways are very narrow, and I've been able to go and touch the back end as as this one dog walks past me, I touch the back end right by the tail, and I know this dog is going to switch over and attack me for being touched because that's what I'm doing. I'm deliberately triggering this dog that has a 700 psi bite strength. I'm deliberately triggering the dog as a part of down training and because it's a predatorial aspect of this dog's behavior i need to do things like that and it's not trigger stacking which is a misnomer etc etc and we'll get to that in a few seconds here um wow i'm almost here in an hour now so i'll touch this dog as he's walking past me and he will be able to immediately turn around from where he is after i touch him and he'll be able to come back and grab my hand and bite my hand and hold on to my hand Five and a half feet, turning around as I'm pulling my hand away, he's still able to turn around and grab my hand. So these dogs know what are going on. They're predators, for, for sure. So when we're making these liberties without knowing our dog's behavior, we're just playing the risk. And when we're playing the risk. We can't go and say, well, you know what, I don't know what's wrong with the dog. You got to say, you know what, I'm not looking and seeing the signs of my dog's behavior, and that's why my dog is reacting to me. Um, yeah, anyways... So, so again, the multiple, the single bite to the multiple bites and to the bites towards the face it is an anxiety aspect. It understand uh, the dog understands where the control and, and aspects of our behavior are coming from, and the dog is saying no, don't. And more than likely, those multiple bites are either three or four successive bite type behavior as well, which is an anxiety driven aspect of it, which is that part again from that relationship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, that's something uh, a bit more. Okay, so I'm going to just end this. I'm not going to talk about the trigger stacking and all this stuff because I've gone over an hour, uh, almost an hour, I think. Um, and I, I don't want to bore people as well. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If you have anything as else, anybody want to make some comments before I, I close up? Um, and uh, yeah, anyhow, let me know <laughs> if there's anything I um, I know that uh, I'll be doing this again tomorrow, and hopefully I'll have some uh, different stuff to talk about. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me, and uh, thank you so much till we uh, talk again. Bye-bye.